so welcome to Morris Federation online event. Uh, my name is Pauline Woods Wilson, and today we also have Mike and Jenny Everett and Fee Lock helping host this event. And today we have Stephen Rowley on a history of mumming. So without any further ado, straight over to Stephen. Jolly good. Right. Oh, I can do that. <laughs> I can override your gallery. Right. Uh, welcome. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me, Pauline and, and the Morris Federation. Um, I'm delighted to be here again doing a uh, Morris Federation talk online and so many friends here as well. So it's really great. Um, I'm particularly pleased to see Peter Harrop here because he's really a big inspiration for this talk and um, has uh, really um, held my hand all the way through my sort of um, route of discovery about uh, uh, about mummers. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, share screen. So um, you should now have um, a history of mumming. I'm hoping you can all see that because um, I can't see. I, I can close that. There we I can see you. Uh, jolly good, Pauline's giving me the, uh, the heads up on that. Right. OK, right. I have got. Um, OK, I've got a, a confession to make right at the start is um, I am a mama. That's me on the left there. And this is my family. <laughs> um, my brother, Damon, that's the um, uh, that's the jolly green um, dragon there. Uh, we started uh, in the early 70s in Luton, uh, St Albans area. We were members of a, uh, a dance group and um, the dance group did mumming at Christmas and that's what we did. We walked through the streets causing mirth and merriment for the audiences and um, yeah with our tale of St George and the Turkish knight and the dragon and all this kind of stuff and um, in the following 40 plus years I've mummed my way around the country playing my parts both ancient and modern and um, that's um, that's our friend uh, there who's um, I think he might be here with us as well as my brother Richard, who is in the audience here, and uh, they're his two sons. So uh, we're, we're, uh, we're it's a family affair. This is the Caddington Mummers, and we've been doing the same play for a very long time. Um, but in the nineties, I started to research in the history of the pipe and tabber in England. I was a bit worried that it was beginning to die out, so I founded the International Pipe and Tabber Festival and set up the Pipe and Tabo Research Symposium, an international symposium which happens every year. And um, that really got me involved in, in um, historical research into folk traditions and folk music uh, in quite an interesting way. And so this is a group of us there um, from, from several countries, uh, uh, um, uh, from Japan and uh, Spain and America, as well as uh, the UK. Um, taking the pipe and tabra as a starting point, I was, um, that, that was uh, historically the sole instrument for Morris dancing. I was a Morris dancer too, so the breadth of my research widened to the early history of Morris dance, and this I was greatly helped by the recent publication of, at that time of uh, Professor John Forrest's book, The Hist Early History of Morris Dancing, and together with Andy Richards and Simon Pipe, we set up a dance research project called Rose Moresque to consider what the earliest English Morris might have looked like. And um, delving into the archives and talking to the historians and the academics opened up a new world for me and turned over my pre-held perceptions of, of where Morris dancing came from. And um, well, being a mama, I sort of followed that on. And um, in 2011, I was asked to help set up a thing called the Mummers Festival in Bath. And as part of that, I founded the International Mummers Symposium uh, with mama and professor Peter Harrop. And um, uh, we aim to bring together practicing mummers with academic researchers from around the world to explore the breadth of mumming and see what we could learn from each other about all aspects of the tradition. And there's Peter there, and um, there's the, the crowd. This was in, um, I think, 2013 in Gloucester. So um, 10 years on, it's been a fantastic journey. Incredible papers and talks from across the UK, Ireland, Scandinavia, Europe, Newfoundland, Canada, USA, 
and Caribbean. And these have really opened our eyes, not just of mumming itself, but we've also had the opportunity to understand other traditions that have similarities and help us put mumming in a broader context. Through the course of these symposiums, the academics have revealed to the mummers a wealth of historical evidence, uh, whilst in return the mummers of today have provided the professors, the academics and the folklorists with plenty to work on with their personal accounts that express the diversity of mumming practice in the 20th and 21st century revivals. And this helps to um, put in place uh, um, a good body of understanding uh, for people in the future to understand what was happening now. There have been a number of key publications along the way which have helped to inform us, um, in particular uh, Twycross and Carpenter's uh, book uh, from uh, I think it was year 2000, Masks and Masking in Medieval and Tudor England, and Claire Sponsler's The Queen's Dumb Shows about John Lidgett and the making of early theatre, and publications by some of you will know these people very well, Peter Millington, Paul Smith, Mike Preston, Christopher Court, and uh, Thomas Pettit's work on non-play mumming. Um, there is a growing uh, body of good quality uh, literature about the subject. Um, in 2020, ah, right, which, um, yeah, 2021, uh, the beginning of this year, Peter gave a keynote talk based on his book, Mummer's Plays Revisited, which is a remarkable work that brings together his scholastic experience with a professional career from a professional career in drama history research and his personal experience of being a mummer and doing mumming and soling plays. Um, but what I'm presenting here is I'm picking bits from all of these sources uh, and all of the symposia in an attempt to string this two together into some kind of continuous history. And I seriously hope I don't misrepresent anyone. And, um, uh, and um, I apologize if I do and uh, stand ready to be corrected. And um, so where do we start? Go back in time, medieval mumming. If you search medieval mummers, you will know <laughs> in no time at all come across this uh, lovely image this drawing, which came comes from Struts, Sports and part Island, I think, um, Mummers, Bodleian. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's interesting, but it isn't Mummers. It's taken from a, uh, uh, a margin, a border of a manuscript from uh, 1344. And uh, this particular manuscript is the deluxe edition of the Romance of Alexander, a fantastic book, uh, which um, uh, was a, a big hit all, all across Western world and, and the Middle East as well. Uh, this particular di beautiful edition was scribed in 1338 and then passed on to the illustrator who dashed off the, um, the, the paintings in merely six years. Um, there's no mentions of mummers in the entire book. Um, so those border illustrations look like performers of some kind, but we know not what they're performing or the context. There's nothing in it to suggest they are mummers. So if we go back a long way, in comes I, St. George. If you go back in the history of uh, mumming, got to be St. George there somewhere. Well, he was a Roman soldier, martyred in 303 AD, believed to be of Cappadocian origin, probably um, a, a general in the in the army. He was not a knight. Um, he didn't fight any dragons. Uh, that was a story that was added in the ninth century. And in 1350, um, he was adopted by Edward III as the patron saint of England. Of course, he, um, he didn't particularly like having uh, Edmund as the patron saint, uh, because Edmund um, refused to stand up and fight against the incoming Normans. So, um, uh, invaders. So, he, um, uh, um, he was martyred by being tied to a tree and used for archery practice. Not the kind of thing that Edward III needed to spur on his troops. Um, there were processions and plays on April 23rd from, um, from the 14th century onwards. And um, uh, yeah, they are interesting, but um, they're not the mummers plays. Um, and at this point, the things which he does in the mummers plays haven't happened yet. Even though he's been dead for 1200 years, uh, they haven't happened. 
and we'll explain why in a moment. Let's look at the first information we have about mumming and uh, the etymology. Uh, if you look at the various description or various um, definitions of the word um, OED, uh, in mama, it said mum, to be silent, moma in the old French, to wear a disguise or to masquerade, mum, a, a, a mask visage, momery, the drama in Greek, and mum chance, a game of luck played with, da uh, with dice. Well, it's quite interesting. Um, but what does that got to do with what we do? Where's St. George and all that? And we look at the early mummers. There is a, uh, um, a particular kind of mumming that we find in the 14th century. Uh, it's not just in England. It's in the Low Countries as well. It's a domestic house visiting uh, thing, mostly in the post-Christmas time, especially on Twelfth Night. But post Christmas extends right up to Shrove Tuesday, uh, so uh, it you find it referred to in a number of things. And the main element is disguise. Nobody expects disguise. Uh, the format of this uh, 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 is a disguise. People wearing masks. They don't say anything. So um, they, if they make a noise, it's mom 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 mom. Much in the way that. Um, uh, Stage actors might go rhubarb, rhubarb, rhubarb to do mumbling. And there's mimed action and there's a game of dice. So um, imagine this, a group of disguised masked people arrive at your door and expect to be invited into your house during festivities. They don't speak, but they're not silent. Um, you provide them with refreshments. They make it clear with their mimed action that they wish to play you at a game of dice for money. The dice is weighted and not in your favour. You know the dice is weighted and they know you know the dice is weighted. But you have fun and you do it anyway and they depart with some money and it's all in the air of Christmas jollity. Well, how do we know about this? There are descriptions of uh, this here and in, uh, in Europe and reports and even iconography. And I particularly love uh, this one. This one, um, I've got to remember where this one comes from. I think this one's from Netherlands. And uh, here we see uh, the game of dice going on. There's the householder and there's masked people here. And they are clearly, um, it's not a professional kind of thing. This is, uh, this is improvised disguise. Uh, there's a man here dressed as a woman and uh, skirts her up a little bit to show that he's wearing trousers underneath. This guy's got a pot on his head for a hat. She's got an improvised headdress here with a with probably a sheet hanging over it. And the thing, a, a sort of griddle thing that made to look like a fiddle. And um, they're playing a game of dice. And uh, yes, it, it's, not a, it's not an elaborate professional disguise at this point. It is definitely... Um, uh, um, uh, improvised. And we do have descriptions of even back then uh, people going and mumming uh, with a sheet over their head. In fact, you know, that was in some places considered to be what you did. <laughs> um, in other places, wearing a coat turned inside out. If you haven't got a wardrobe of dressing up clothes and things, a very con uh, convenient uh, solution. Uh, so, um, yeah, so this is this is um, general household visiting house visiting mumming, and where does it come from? Well, it's in a context. People didn't just do the mumming as a, a masking as a mumming thing. There was at that time a predating uh, tradition of carnival, uh, a winter festival. Um, particularly um, in the uh, days or weeks before Shrovetide, Shrove Tuesday. So it's a pre-Lenten um, bit of fun making before things get very austere and, and uh, serious during Lent. It involves uh, masking in disguise and it happens across Europe. Um, but the funny thing is it doesn't really get going in England. If you think about our um, carnival activities, well, such as they are, 
we have a few football games and where a, a, a something is um, kicked from one village to the next, say, and uh, Pancake Day. Uh, Carnival never really got going in England. Um, but in um, this is Rome, <laughs> and you're probably familiar with um, with uh, uh, Venice and the Venice Carnival masks. So here we are, Rome. Uh, there's definitely a whole lot of fun going on, and people wearing masks and getting away with all kinds of, uh, of things. And they even had mask balls and the like, and uh, and very strong in the Catholic countries. But there's a little bit of a difference, a bit of a dividing line here. Carnival predates mumming and it is, covers a much larger area. Mumming is a much uh, smaller thing. There are possible Roman or origins. There was um, uh, a popular masking activity in, in the calends of January uh, who has been reported in various places. And so, uh, and uh, this business of uh, turning things upside down so slaves might be made masters for the day as things are over christmas in some places here like the um uh, the choir boy who becomes the bishop in certain cathedrals um so it's um carnival is very widespread whereas um uh, mumming is much more um the northwest and um, carnival evolves in quite an interesting way, but with the Reformation, the Protestant countries largely drop carnival, but it remains strong in the Catholic countries. But some of the Protestant countries uh, keep it. And if you go to Catholic cities, where strong Catholic cities in the, in the North, like Cologne or Basel, uh, you have some fantastic uh, um, traditions. And I can well recommend both of those cities for um, Shrove Tuesday. Um, great time and um, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on um, yes there's big processions over carnival but there are a whole load of other vi house visiting dancing masking and disguised traditions within this that we would quite recognize and in some cases they're like a parallel to mummy and a very common part of this is men dress as women women dress as men poor dressing as rich and rich dressing as poor um, and with your mask on you have a license to flirt carnival was exported um the french uh took it the uh, spanish and portuguese took it to the americas um you're probably familiar with the french inspired mardi gras from new orleans and the rio carnival rio de janeiro carnival and <laughs> strangely enough it it does make an appearance in england as it's re-exported back to england and we have our our carnival in August in Notting Hill. But mumming um, uh, does manage to continue post-Reformation in the uh, in Protestant countries, and um, it is more focused on Twelfth Night. We get, find it in um, England, Low Countries, Scandinavia, in the North Atlantic Islands and beyond, as I will uh, describe. So this is a domestic mumming we've been talking about. I'm going to move on now to courtly mumming, uh, which happens over quite a period, and um, uh, it turns out to be quite important in, in some ways. Um, a really good example, of, early example of this is Richard II's, his birthday. He was the boy king, uh, made king, I think, about the age of 10. And um, in 1377, his birthday entertainment was a mumming. And that mumming involved disguise, mimed action, game of dice, and gift giving. Uh, elaborate disguises, all the, all the mum people who made the mumming were people from the household, but dressed as knights and cardinals. And the game of dice was with loaded dice, but they played it the other way around so that the king always won. And uh, after, the, after the mumming, there was dancing for all. Um, now, mumming could have a political uh, uh, aspect in, in a courtly way. Um, the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths organised a mumming for Richard II. Um, they must have wanted to curry favour, and it worked. In 1398, he then granted them a new charter and the authority to hold property and charge rents to raise money. 
John of Gaunt was potentially a big threat to Richard II. He was the brother of the late Black Prince, and he had some claim to the throne, and it was feared that he might attempt to depose or dispose of the boy Richard. But no, he organised a lavish mumming for the young king, thereby signalling his allegiance. Um, and we come into the 15th century and courtly mumming, and we have mumming texts. Fabulous. Surely we must have St George now. Well, sort of. Um, yes and no. <laughs> uh, there were uh, St George plays around this time, which were based on the life of St George. And um, uh, this man uh, actually wrote uh, a, a text on the life of St George. Um, it isn't a mama's play. However, he is uh, John Lidgett and um, uh, originally a monk, but he became uh, the superstar scriptwriter of the per period. He produced some absolutely amazing poetry and these mumming texts. He was commissioned to write texts for courtly mummings um, at Eltham Castle, Hartford Castle, um, and uh, at Windsor. And I can't remember whether these mercers, one of the goldsmiths or mercers, was actually for the king as well. Um, now, these mummings um, aren't St George or anything like that. They, they play to a, 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 an interest at the time, the Renaissance interest in Greek myth. And he wrote these extraordinary fantasies. Um, he builds up um, uh, incredible stories about, uh, you know, like Jason leaving ancient Greece but sailing west along the Mediterranean coast instead of going up into the Black Sea, out into the Atlantic, up across Biscay, through the English Channel, turns right into the Thames, into London, and into the feasting hall, bearing gifts for the king. And apparently a great big ship uh, piece of um, scenery was built for this. Um, uh, they aren't dialogue. These mumming texts are narrated with mimed action. And... Um, they are sycophantic to a level uh, n unimaginable, <laughs> even today. Um, so this is from the uh, beginning of the mumming at Eltham. Lo, here beginneth a ballad made by Don jo John Lydgate at Eltham in Christmas for a mumming to fall be the king and the queen. Bacchus, which is a god of the glad vine, Juno and Ceres, according to all these three, through their power, which that is divine, send their gifts unto your majesty. Wine, wheat, oil, oil, by marsh hands that be here, which represent unto your high nobleness, peace with your liege, plenty and gladness. And so it continues. <laughs> and um, uh, it is all about um, our, uh, presenting uh, the, the power, I suppose, of the king um showing status by um placing the gods of the greek gods uh at um at his uh, at, at, at his feet so to speak you know coming to show pay court to the english king um it's um well written and poetic um but it's not dialogue and it's not a humorous play and there's no net, net resurrection no life and death um uh but it's a narration with extravagant costumes and huge pieces of moving scenery and mimed action. And there is a theory that uh, the narrator actually takes on a particular role, uh, which then evolves into the Lord of Misrule. So that's one of the theories. Um, so courtly mumming uh, involves disguise, uh, mimed action, uh, particularly on Twelfth Night. I think all of those Lidgate mummings were Twelfth Night mummings. Um, homegrown, they're not done by professional actors, they're done by the members of the guild or the, or the court. Um, they can have a political gift, uh, element and gift giving. Um, and uh, there is, uh, you know, if you search for courtly mumming, <laughs> you will find an image, which is this one. Um, the court mummers, and there they are, the prancing around. They do look like they're in their raggy jackets there and everybody's watching on and the musicians. Um, but what's this? The man at the front is pulling his 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 vestments open bearing his manly chest 
Oh, it's another not mumming. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is the tragic story of the Bal des Ardennes, um, where the king of France uh, was uh, going to perform a dance, uh, the dance of the wild men, with four of his noble men to entertain their guests, and they were stitched into this wild costume. And it was recognised this was highly flammable, so all the torches were taken to the back of the room. But one guest did not get the message. He came into the room with his torch and went right up to the dancers to get a better look and set them alight. The ladies leapt forward, wrapped a cloak, cloak around the king to keep him safe, but the other dancers died from their burns. Um, but you'll find images of this going, uh, uh, you know, it's a popular um, story, uh, you know, dramatic story. Um, let's step away from the mumming a bit and see what's going on with the hoi polloi during the um, uh, uh, 16th and early 17th century. And we still have that house visiting uh, disguise the dice game but we're beginning to get something also which looks like guess the mama that it's a bit more of a you know who's it's going to be your neighbors that come round to do the the mumming you invite them in um uh, they might do what they can to disguise themselves and their voices and you really have to guess which of your neighbors it is um we also start getting more um contemporary contemporary reports within other bits of cultural history, uh, literary appearances, particularly in plays. And here's a number of plays which uh, have some elements, some actually directly uh, reference mumming. Uh, the Basarus, which is a Dutch one uh, by Macropedius, it actually has a whole scene where um, uh, you know, one of the actors just goes, mum, 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 mum. But some of the other ones, the, the actors are actually silent it's all mimed uh the love's labor's lost one it's really more of a thing that they take a part of the form of the highly developed courtly mummy at that time uh as a way of delivering uh part of the plot so um um you know we get we get these things that people would have known this uh they would recognize this in the play because it was a item uh, something of contemporary culture so um, here we are, we're getting towards the end of the um, 16th century and um, uh, the Reformation comes in and following that the Puritans. What did the Puritans ever do for us? Well they didn't like Christmas for a start and they didn't like a lot of things and before the Puritans the, the leaders of the Reformation um, were quite again a lot of the, uh, of the folk traditions. Um, here's quite an interesting, a typical one, which um, I, I know Jameson's here, he will have come across plenty of these things. Um, this was uh, a, 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 a church visitation to the city of Gloucester. Um, uh, basically uh, telling the minister and the church wardens um, to, um, uh, or, or asking, checking whether they have suffered the Lord's misrule, summer lords, or any disguised persons or others, or May games or Morris dancers at Christmas to come unruinedly into the church or churchyard and to dance and so on and so on. Um, uh, basically, uh, um, all of this stuff they saw as quite ungodly and uh, was to be uh, avoided by all good men. And um, anybody who's uh, read uh, John Forrest's book on his, this er period in Morris dance will understand uh, just how uh, things had changed. Previously, Morris dance had been well supported by the church uh, because they used it to, <laughs> to make money at their church ales and things, but the church authorities and the Puritan government prosecuted those who supported Morris. And a lot of our references to Morris dancing in that period are, are found in prosecutions of, of, um, of clergy for allowing Morris dancing. Um, so, so it was with, uh, with, with mumming. So um, there they were um, uh, trying to stamp this out for you know, religious purposes, but also there, there were a number of prosecutions uh, that were really aimed at stopping uh, unscrupulous mumming. <laughs> People using their um, 
disguise to gain entry into houses uh, and commit uh, uh, crimes. So, you know, uh, there was that aspect and that starts back then and it continues. And uh, you find references to it around uh, around the mumming world, <laughs> as we will come to to later, uh, continue right up into the 20th century. Um, the Puritans uh, really got stuck in and um, uh, for many people, all their Christmas traditions were put on hold and many things, traditions were lost due to the fact that uh, this period of uh, anti uh, frivolity and traditions was was uh, was banned in many places and uh, generations passed uh, before the restoration of the king. Um, there was quite a campaign to restore Christmas and um, you've got pamphlets um, and this one I particularly like here is on the left we have the Puritan in the middle is old father Christmas and uh, there's a whole story about the personification of Christmas and on the right there's every man and um, the Puritan is saying keep out do not come here and father Christmas is saying sir I bring good cheer and the everyman is saying, old Christmas, welcome, do not fear. So, uh, and this was a pamphlet put out to, you know, generally um, uh, encourage Christmas. And that was 1653. Old Father Christmas, um, personification of Father Christmas probably goes back at least 100 years before that. But old Father Christmas came to represent the Christmas that they had lost during the uh, Puritan period. Anyway, where were we? What did the Puritans ever do for us? Well, one of the big things they did was reading and printing. Printing was good because it made copies of the Bible affordable to ev everyone. Well, nearly everyone, everyone who mattered. <laughs> and the Puritans saw education as a good thing because people would then be able to read those Bibles that they had bought. And they could read the good word for themselves direct from the Bible. Of course, um, uh, you know, education uh, can also um, have its dangers, its drawbacks. A little bit of learning is a dangerous thing. And people who learn to read won't necessarily just read the Bible or even read the Bible. They might want to read other material and perhaps something a little lighter than a religious text. And printers were happy to oblige, producing cheap, accessible publications, especially chapbooks these are like little pocket books um they're very popular there's loads of different kinds uh, all kinds of stories um uh, parables and things like that but also uh, jokes um recipes general knowledge uh, uh little plays in them so uh, uh bits of history so Anything that would um, tempt somebody to buy an interesting little bit of, of entertaining reading. And uh, there are hundreds of these. And it's quite interesting. There were printers all over the country. Uh, a city might have several uh, uh, printers going. And they'd all be stealing stuff from each other because it's quite a challenge to keep writing new good material. So if they read something from some so that came from London that looked good, they would copy it and they would copy the illustrations as well. And you find that these, these copies, um, you know, sort of stories and these, these books spread throughout the, uh, throughout the country. Um, where are we? Oh, well, we are in, um, we're around um, late 16th century and um, it must be time for St. George, I think. In comes I, St. George. Well, in this case, he does. Um, about 100 years earlier, Lydgate had written a legend of St. George for the armories of London, uh, which was really based on what they knew of the, of the, the story of St. George, plus some of the um, bits that had been added along in the time. But um, uh, Richard Johnson, a printer, he um, had a brilliant idea. He wrote a blockbuster the history and gallant achievements of the seven champions of Christendom. Uh, this was about 1596. And uh, he brought together the histories of seven saints, weaving them together into an interesting narrative. 
When I say histories, I probably mean myths. <laughs> he didn't worry too much about accuracy. What he wanted was a good rip-roaring tale. And St George and his siblings were born in the storm by a Caesarean section. St George was born with a lightning strike scar on his forehead. No, that was Harry Potter, wasn't it? No, he had a scar. Was it on his chest or on his leg? I can't remember. But, um, you know, it is actually very Harry Potter-esque in this respect. It's a fantasy. Uh, he was born and um, the babies were straight away stolen by the nurse who turned them into stone. But St George tricked her and they were released. And then they had many challenges, uh, giants to fight, goals to achieve. And St George is tricked into fighting each of his brothers and killing them. But at the end, they're all joined together in the final section in a dance. And it's in this story that St George is transformed from a Roman soldier to a medieval knight errant, the courageous knight riding around Europe and righting wrongs. Sort of a combination of the, like Richard the Lionheart, together with the St George um, uh, story. So it's not a, a dry history of the saints, but a piece of creative fantasy fiction. As a writer and printer and publisher, Richard Johnson could have done with uh, an editor. Um, if anybody's tried to read it, and I can recommend it, it's definitely well worth uh, going at, but you do have to keep with it. Sometimes you wonder if the printer's apprentice accidentally dropped all the pages on the floor as they came off the press and then hurriedly stacked them, but he put them in the wrong order before sending them to the bookbinder. Um, sometimes <laughs> you really wonder where you are, but it's a brilliant story. And uh, it spawned uh, lots of copies, by the chapbook printers around the country who took sections out of it and made their own little sets of chapbooks and, and the like. There were no copyright laws. So unscrupulous scrupulous publishers would um, plagiarize everything and print those versions. And as such, um, the Seven Champions became a source for a, a great uh, number of uh, interesting stories. Now in the 17th century, uh, the house visiting the domestic mumming was still uh, going on, uh, whether it's lawful or not. Um, and uh, uh, in comes uh, Father Christmas, welcome or welcome not. Uh, um, and the playing of dice seems to be less prevalent, but there's definitely a, a sense of um, guess the mama and uh, a very convivial affair uh, between neighbours one could even possibly see it as being a forerunner of the fancy dress party uh, that we're so familiar. Um, I don't know if it's familiar now, but in the 70s, it really was. <laughs> Thomas Pettit, the researcher in Denmark, coins the term convivial, convivial mumming for this kind of house visiting. Um, and it, it evolves, continues well into the 18th century, house visiting, um, Twelfth Night, in disguise, mimed action, guess the mama, and cadging. Somewhere along the way, this kind of mumming uh, became a cadging tradition. In the same way that way sailing, house visiting way sailing, was a cadging tradition. Carol singing was beginning to come a, a, a cadging tradition. And in the same way that Morris dancing had become a cadging tradition, although probably more in the summer. Um, Don this disguise, go around, knock on the door, mum, 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 and uh, let the house of try and guess which neighbour you are and stick out your hand for some pennies. <laughs> uh, and uh, we have evidence that sometimes it was children that did this rather than adults. And uh, through this period, the strength of cadging uh, grows. All things considered, Christmas is quite a good cadging season with carol singing, way sailing and mumming. And um, we're fortunate that in the Georgian period, in early Victorian time, we start to get the rise of the antiquarian. These were the forerunners of uh, popular historians. They saw a point in recording the customs and traditions of the country around them and publishing their books, in <clears throat> uh, publishing the material in things like the Book of Days, the Book of Hours, sports and pastimes and the like. So we actually get records of of uh, observations of this kind of thing happening. Um, so yeah, house visiting, Twelfth Night, disguise, mimed action, guess the mama, cadging, and 
A mama's play. Hooray, we get there at last. In comes I, St. George. Well, actually, not really, Prince George. Um, anybody familiar with uh, the variety of mama's play scripts will know that, um, yes, everybody knows about St. George as the hero, but there are plenty of collected plays where the hero is not St. George, but Prince George or even King George. And there is a reason behind this. And it was really Peter Harrop, who's who's in the audience today, um, uh, researched into the history of the Mummers play. And he uncovered the reasons here. Um, let's have a look at uh, this first play, which appears somewhere in the middle of the uh, 18th century, somewhere 17. Uh, 40, 1750 time. We're not quite sure. We know this printer was printing over a particular period of time, <clears throat> so it's difficult to nail uh, the actual date of this down. But uh, you have a look here. Alexander and the King of G Egypt, a mock play as it is acted by mamas every Christmas. There's quite some interesting things here to take in and to take apart. Well, I'll start with a bit about the mamas. Was it acted by mamas every Christmas, or was it uh, the um, Mr. White's uh, clever marketing ploy to sell more chapbooks? Uh, we will never know, uh, but certainly it's the kind of thing which follows on from the other chapbooks of, of, of little plays. So it's not unusual in that respect. And um, um, Alexander and the King of Egypt. Um, that's an interesting story. Uh, we're probably talking here about Alexander the Great and the King of Egypt. And a mock play. What is a mock play? So let's have a look at that a bit more detail. Um, now, Peter Harrop has researched this back and uh, realized that uh, the mock play was dependent on something which happened much earlier. In the uh, early, or no, in the restoration really, after, Reforma uh, after the Reformation and the Puritan period, uh, there came to rise um, more formal kinds of drama, more indoor type of theatres, more serious stuff. And uh, uh, we do have the restoration comedies, which everybody was <laughs> very pleased to have, a bit of light-hearted stuff after all the religious stuff. But in comes uh, John Dryden, the poet, who pioneers a form of theatre that became popular called the heroic drama. He devised rules for the heroic drama, rhyming stanzas, closed couplets in iambic pentameter. Um, that uh, The second rule was that they would be... Uh, the drama would reflect grand events, nation forming events or big mythical events. And the, at the heart of every story was a powerful hero who is the hero of the drama, whether he's right or not. Um, so this was quite a big, um, uh, a big thing going on. And they were very popular, but certainly not trivial entertainment. <laughs> uh, but uh, they, they tackled big subjects. Um, uh, one of the subjects was the things that are happening at that time with the Turkish wars, uh, which went on for quite a while and were a great topic for, for, th uh, for things. But um, Dryden's biggest hit was one called The Conquest of Granada, uh, to do with the uh, Moorish invasion of, uh, of the Iberian Peninsula. And another of his great hits was a rewriting of Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra as a heroic drama called All for Love. And really, um, around this time, they were the height of sophistication. But as we move into the 18th century, uh, there's a rapid diversity of theatre. We get opera coming in. Uh, comedy adopts um, various things, including Commedia dell'arte from, from Italy. Pantomime is one of the outputs of that. There is a theatre happening in a small scale in pleasure gardens with uh, professional actors uh, entertaining at the weekends. Um, music hall uh, was taken off and altogether uh, stage performance was becoming accessible to a large number of people. Um, and 
Although heroic drama could still draw an audience in the 1720s, its lofty style and serious themes became an opportunity uh, in the eyes of other playwrights for some uh, comedy. And there was a thing called, uh, called um, uh, or there was a kind of work that was a parody of the heroic drama. And these became known as mock plays, uh, most famously Henry Fielding's The Tragedy of Tragedies, The Life and Death of Tom Thumb the Great. And Henry Carey, not long after, Chronon Hotontholagos, the most tragical tragedy that ever was tragedized by any company of tragedicians. I'm sure that fed into um, uh, Rowan Atkinson's um, Blackadder. <laughs> I've got the cunningest, most cunning plan ever cunningly thought by cunning people. Um, so uh, that later one by Henry Ca uh, Carey there um, was a satire on Robert Walpole and uh, and Queen Caroline, the wife of George II. And we, who knows what was going on there? Um, uh, the Tom, the, the, these mock plays also became known as laughing tragedies. And um, they were used, they would use satire to address contemporary uh, issues and actually poke th fun at the very form of, um, you know, high status theatre itself. So we come to the first um, actual Mummers play text. And incredibly, it is a text. It's not just a mention. There is a full text. Uh, there's four, uh, four in the cast. Uh, Alexander. Uh, the King of Egypt, Prince George, and the Doctor. And um, here's um, an interesting, uh, right at the start, scene two. Room, room, brave gallants, give us room to sport, for in this room we have mind to resort. Resort and to repeat to your mer merry rhyme, for remember, good sirs, this is Christmas time. And so it continues on. And it's a great little play for four players, and, uh, I, you know, I... I think we ought to do a version of it. It would be great fun. And a lot of lines you would recognise today. Lines which we don't find in anything before. So in comes Prince George, and it's a satire. Prince George, the soon-to-be King George III, is the hero. But he's given the words of St George, effectively, as in the knight errant, uh, crusading around, and in this case, going to fight against Alexander the Great in Egypt. And um, I am Prince George, a champion brave and bold, for with my spear I've won three crowns of gold. Twas that I brought the dragon to the slaughter, and that I gained the Egyptian monarch's daughter. In Egypt's fields I prisoner long was kept, but my valour, by my valour, I from them soon escaped. I sounded at the great gate of divine and came out with a giant of no good design he gave me a blow which almost struck me dead but i up with my sword and i cut off his head um so he's boasting there in a way that anybody knows mama's play will will find familiar so the idea of this uh rather soft target uh, uh rather a feat prince george who likes his luxury uh and sweet things uh playing the part of uh, a knight errant uh, was indeed funny at the time. I probably find it quite funny now, <laughs> knowing, knowing the context. Um, the play concludes, well, um, they have a fight and um, George is, is knocked down and the King of Egypt calls the doctor who can cure the itch, the pitch, the pox, the palsy and the gout. And once he's revived, they fight again. And this time it's Alexander who uh, expires and is dragged off. He isn't revived. And the play concludes with the cadging speech, a reminder that their costume was expensive and it is Christmas after all, a time of good cheer, and they hope they've made good sport and pleased the company. And um, so this was a, a really good popular um, uh, thing, clearly, because other publishers ripped it off and printed it. And over the next hundred years, you can follow the trail of who printed uh, which versions and uh, where in the country it went. Uh, Mike Preston and Paul Smith 
uh, and um, is it Mike Smith, um, you know, did a wonderful job tracking that down. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it started spreading, but things were quite slow. We don't get many references in that early period um, at the end of the uh, 18th century, 1750 onwards, but they really start to build up by the time you get to uh, um, 1800. Uh, so, um, by then, uh, there's other plays appearing. Uh, just have a little look at some of the characters in the early plays. And um, if you really want the, the in-depth stuff on this, there's a fantastic chapter in this in uh, Peter's book, which I shall come to uh, eventually, um, which uh, describes uh, the various characters. We can just look at a couple of them here. Uh, the Turkish knight is not the archetypal more that um, people have made him out to be. He is a stock theatrical character from uh, the heroic dramas about the Turkish wars that were happening at the end of the 17th century. Uh, anybody um, going or seeing this would recognize that character. Um, the doctor, the doctor has probably got the longest provenance in that he was appearing in um, plays going right back into the 16th century, a Commedia dell'arte doctor, really fascinating stuff, Il Dottore, and uh, there's the, the words, the scripts, but also uh, there's the stuff, the business that he does, you know, with examining the body and putting the, uh, giving him the, the cure and all this kind of stuff and testing his pulse in his leg and his arm comes up and all this kind of stuff. That is all there in the Commedia dell'arte. Commedia dell'arte is full of little routines called Lazzi, and those Lazzi are all, uh, the, the, all those doctors Lazzi all go back well into the 16th century. So they are, um, they just come straight through. And it's one thing I find really interesting is that when you look at the Mummer's Play scripts that are collected and, uh, or printed in the, in the chat books, they don't have any of that stuff. They just have what the doctor says, but he might say, I will, uh, you know, um, I'll examine the body or something like that. Um, he's half dead or whatever. And all of the physical stuff has come through uh, the business, so to speak, has come through by uh, oral tradition, effectively, or physical tradition rather than oral. Um, we've already mentioned um, the, uh, uh, the the Father Christmas here, and um, he... Um, uh, He's definitely old Father Christmas, and he refers to that that character that you know campaigned for Christmas right through the Puritan period, and is a memory of what Christmas used to be like uh, before the Reformation. In Victorian period, we get early Victorian period, we get quite a significant development. There are other stories appear. Nelson, after the Battle of Trafalgar, was the national hero. He was like you know. David Beckham of the time, really, everybody wanted to see him. He toured around the country, everybody went to see him. Um, not after Trafalgar, obviously, but after his previous um, uh, uh, famous battles, the Battle of the Nile and the like. Um, there's the wooing story, and uh, which really comes out of the, the kind of little dramas and things that you get in the pleasure gardens of the 18th century. And Robin Hood and the Tanner is a very popular uh, mama's play. And that was published um, originally, I think, 17th century, but you find it printed and uh, repeated. So this is material that is um, that is all there and printed and being snapped up and used for mumming. And the heyday of the mummer's play takes us through uh, the early 19th century, um, it, well into the into the mid late 19th century here's uh, the mummers uh, at Chilworth 1864 with their rag jackets and a tabra there uh, two of my worlds collide <laughs> um, and uh, we don't know which one these are I am St George with sword and lance and this is how I fought in France and there's Father Christmas over there uh, all fantastic stuff um, Alex Helm, a great researcher, did loads of work uh, collecting some of the visual stuff um, of, uh, of the 
costumes that people wore and um, his book is really worth uh, getting and, and looking at that kind of stuff but we're quite fortunate at this time um, people start getting interested in the history or, or the, the folklore around them you know the the interest in folk song uh Cecil Sharp but actually there were a number of people before that looking at folklore in the sort of 1880s that sort of time and carrying on through it you know Cecil Sharp really uh, injected it with some vigor and um in the 1930s James Madison Carpenter an American researcher uh, uh came over and he did a huge amount going around collecting mama's plays specifically there were others collecting but he did a fantastic job apparently he would write to uh, vicars it'd make a draw a route on a map and then write to the vicars in each village and say i am coming to your village in you know on the third of uh, of december um i wonder if you know or you could ask around is there anybody remembers the mummers and uh, perhaps I could meet them at the vicarage. And then he would take down the, the scripts from them. And by this time, most of the mummers were people who had done mumming back in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, before it really started to die out. And they were old men and they were remembering it, but they can remember it really well because the structure is those same closed couplet iambic pentameter <laughs> stanzas uh, that we find in heroic drama they are very distinctive and really easy to remember um and it's quite interesting he was going around in uh, 1930s at which time the revival was starting there were already there were still groups go still going but the revival and and these are the marshfield paper boys um uh i love them they are fantastic and they come from not just not far away from me and they the story is that the vicar in marshfield was um a relative of violet afford uh um you know a keen folklorist and she heard that uh, uh one of his uh staff or garden or whatever did the mumming so um she encouraged him to uh, write it down and then they formed a group and got it going again. Um, so we bring, um, so, you know, we've got starting to get uh, uh, the revivals coming through and uh, there's a post First World War revival, post Second World War revival and the 1970s revival. And these all bring whole new dimensions to it. And uh, by the time we get up to the International Mummers Convention in 2011, <laughs> uh, we've got an extraordinary thing going along. This was in Bath. And um, I, I know there are some people in the audience who, who were there and they're probably on this picture. And we have at the front here, the Irish uh, Fingal Mummers, uh, who are uh, the Straw Boys. And we have mummers from, I think these are the Suffolk Howlers over here and uh various various groups huge oh i'm there all right right at the back there <laughs> um uh huge numbers of of people and there's a group that came um oh this one yeah we had a group that came over the previous year from from catalonia and uh yeah quite an extraordinary the variety that turn up is quite incredible and uh you know we we see uh, amazing um uh, forms and uh, diversity within the mumming um so that's the mummer's play but what happened to the the other kind of mummering that sort of non-play how oh look there's barry goodman there barry goodman over there there he is <laughs> um uh um well in england that coexisted with the mummer's plays but probably they saw that mama's plays were probably a more lucrative way of getting money than just going knocking on the door and sticking out your hand. It was, it, it certainly took over. And gradually we see the, um, uh, the incidents of the uh, non mumming, the convivial mumming uh, uh, disappear, but not so in other countries. So whilst it disappears here in, um, 
Scandinavia, it's really quite strong. And uh, for instance, Norway, it continues right through into the 1960s. Uh, we find uh, a really interesting disguisings going on in Shetland and uh, up in the Faroes. And quite interestingly, there's a big mumming thing that goes on in uh, Newfoundland. And they have a big mummers festival and they have a really good history of mumming, which continued, uh, uh, had its ups and downs because there was drunkenness and there was uh, nefarious activities of going disguised into people's houses and stealing things and whatever. But you know, so it always had a battle with the police. And in various times, I think in the 1950s was the last time it was banned, but they've managed to revive it again now. And this is convivial mum, and there's no play attached to it. It's not that they've lost the play. They never had the play. Um, you know, it is, it is a, a disguised thing. But if you go to other parts of the, um, of the world, Caribbean, uh, there are plays that still exist in some of the islands. And I discovered in Barbados um, and got to know these guys. These are tuck dancers. And they have the characters, they have the giant, uh, the giant and the doctor are combined. <laughs> they have a man, woman, Aunt Sally character. They have um, the steel donkey. Um, he's called the steel donkey. He's a hobby horse, but he's, he's, he's got a steel frame, wire frame. Uh, this, this character here in the rag coat, um, they call Shaggy Bear. And um, when I first went to meet them, and, and there's this guy at the back here, Punka who's a pop star there, but he's also the, the champion of, of the mummers there, called Tuck Dancing. Um, they told me it was, um, it all came from Africa. Um, but then we did quite a bit of research and discovered it came with the uh, indentured servants coming to work in the plantations. And by the fact that they brought the play with them, it was probably came over you know, towards the or probably the beginning of the 19th century. And they actually don't do the play anymore. They've lost the play. They've lost the plot. However, the play crops up in different aspects uh, within uh, other parts of their tradition. So they have a thing called a landship dance. And we were there watching it. Big celebration of landship dance. And uh, part of this, uh, there was a parade and um, they saluted. And one, one man saluted and hit himself so hard he fell on the floor and immediately they went into the doctor routine absolutely straight out of out of a mama's play um uh so these tap dancers they tour around on christmas eve and uh you put out on your windowsill some little glasses of rum and pieces of cake and some money and they come by and they dance outside your house um uh, they go right through the night <laughs> so you don't need to be there to to if you put the the drink and the money out there um you, you don't need to get up and see them you know but th you're happy that they came by um uh, this is interesting this is uh philadelphia and uh these are the philadelphia mamas and uh this is a really big procession on new year's day and there isn't a play but uh, their, their history of it says that it was, um, it started in the late 18th century and it was the product of uh, Dutch, German and Swedish mummers combining their particular tr traditions, in particular going around house visiting in disguise. And it's evolved into this procession. Uh, so the Philadelphia mumming is a is a huge thing. If you type in mumming, <laughs> mummers, if you type in mummers into Google, you'll probably get the Philadelphia mummers first. So here we are. We're right up to date. This is this is what's going on with mumming now. You know, we've, we've got we've gone right through the history, and somehow I haven't um, mentioned um, life, death, resurrection, and pagan fertility rituals. Um, so we better have a little look at that. And um, we I need to introduce uh, in comes Sir James George Fraser. And he was a very interesting man, a very, very interesting man. Uh, and um, he uh, was, I suppose, a bit of a philosopher. He was clearly a, a great thinker. 
and he was tackling this is in the mid uh, 19th century he was tackling with a bit of a conundrum because at that time we were getting an emerging understanding of um, geology Mary Anning was finding fossils and putting together a sequence that clearly predated the creation they had a date for the creation which i think was about you know sort of 3000 bc or something like that um biology uh darwin was uh proposing theories of evolution creating the different kinds of animals and trees rather than which was contradictory to the to the creation story archaeology was another new discipline and uh, they were looking in particular at Stonehenge and coming to the realization that there were human inhabitants that not just predated um, the Romans, but predated the creation. And then he was also receiving input from um, explorers and travelers who were bringing him uh, information about civilizations around the world which did not have any knowledge of Christianity or Christian origins. And in fact, there were missionaries going out to, to, to make them wise to the effect. And uh, tribal dances and fertility rituals. And he got thinking about this. And um, he managed to create a theory, um, thinking that, yeah, this science stuff looks like it's real. And if it's real, then then our picture needs to change and maybe the bible isn't quite all it says it is and maybe might be allegorical in places metaphorical in places so he came up with a theory various theories <laughs> it's quite it's in two volumes the book by the time it final publication um, um that our religious practices like the lamb of god are perhaps relics of pagan pagan rituals and what he's meaning then by pagan is quite different from what we probably think of as pagan now word pagan is very slippery there have been lots of meanings of pagan throughout um throughout history from the romans original pagani uh through various stages in um renaissance time pagan meant the uh the greek gods and uh, to a certain extent roman gods but their fascination was with the greek gods in a sort of more scientific way, uh, Fraser was really looking at pagan in terms of without God. So either you were a Christian or you were pagan because you were without God. And so he was looking at that and thinking that those tribes that people were reporting to him doing fertility rituals, we must have had that they were they were our ancestors in this country and uh, that um, the way we've developed religion is probably very much influenced by uh, what we were doing then. And he extended that to uh, put forward the theory that also our folk traditions go all the way back and are remnants of pagan rituals. Now, he was a very uh, up to the minute, you know, real thinker and uh, he was the start of uh, what we now call social anthropology, ethnography, ethnology, uh, cultural anthropology. Those disciplines didn't really exist. Uh, we were only just starting to get folklorists, let alone these things. So um, he was he was an important founding father in that respect. And he recognized that um, his theories might be um, uh, you know, might have nothing in them, but they're a starting point. As he said, books like mine are merely speculation. They will be superseded sooner or later, and sooner the better for the sake of truth, by better induction based, induction based on fuller knowledge. However, he published his books and um, uh, very quickly uh, people uh, were... Um, were using them. Charlotte Byrne, who was collecting Mummer's plays in Shropshire, uh, referred to what she'd found as the dramatized myth of the strife between summer and winter, taking us back to the very beginning of dramatic art as part of the ceremony 
a ceremonial of rustic religious festivals. And that continued right into the 20th century. Um, even great academics like Alan Brody, 1969, uh, in his book on um, the English and their mama's plays, marveled at the men who still after a thousand years move into the center of the magic circle to reenact the death and resurrection of their earth of the eternal pattern of the seasons. But by this time, there was already uh, uh, a, a, a great body of evidence to show that uh, his theories really had been superseded. And um, in, I think it was 2000, Eddie Cass and Steve Roud had a book on mumming. And uh, they summed it up in this way. As far as the mama's play is concerned, these origin theories usually include the following elements. It's a survivor of a, of a pre-Christian ritual. It's a fertility rite. Death and resurrection part of the play is sympathetic magic to ensure the return of the sun summer each year. And the characters symbolize light, dark, good and evil. And that the last three things are predicted, pre delegated by the first one that is a survival of a pre-Christian ritual and you have to prove that in order for the rest of it to be true and clearly um, they didn't think it was. <laughs> so when we look at James Fraser now and when the ethnologists and social anthropologists look at him they see him as a founding father. Um, uh, uh, very important in that person founding a number of of really important uh, areas and getting them going, uh, which then evolved as discipline with their own methodologies based on fieldwork, observation and evidence. And as such, his pagan theory has completely been rebutted by most, most academics. There are still some corners <laughs> which cling to the Golden Bough, his book, but, um, but more widely, the public uh, still thinks that pagan theory is the theory that Morris dancing mummers and maypole are all pagan fertility rites uh, a theory that was seriously reinforced by the film uh, the wicker man and this has had an impact on mumming itself so there are a number of mummers groups which have ritual as a style uh, at our symposium last year Pete Coe uh, gave uh, a wonderful talk about that saying we deliberately made the the, the, the long man mummers, a ritualistic style. Um, there is anti-mumming uh, feeling. I myself has been in, in a situation where um, I set up a mummers project with some kids at a school, and then I hit the front page of the local newspaper for uh, brainwashing the, um, uh, the children with uh, pagan fertility rights. And um, so, and also within uh, the established uh, drama, you know, it's not looked on as, uh, as uh, well as other forms of drama. It's rather looked down on. And part of that I'm sure is because of the, of the uh, pagan theory. Um, Fraser did hinder research. We spent, years and years, decades, and people are still doing it, looking for pagan uh, fertility, fertility origins of mama's plays, rather than looking at the actual evidence. But on the positive side, we've got pagan mummers who are great fun and give us great spectacles. And this is rock nest mummers at the uh, mummers uh, unconvention uh, 10 years ago, performing in a circle of fire, uh, their mummers play about uh, uh, creation of life it, absolutely fantastic riveting stuff uh, so you know there are some positives there but from my point of view um, looking at the future of mumming uh, books like uh, Peter Harrop's um, uh, book on uh, Mama's Plays Revisited and um, uh, Twycross and Carpenter's Masks and Masking they've opened up uh, uh, our understanding and we have quite a big job to do to improve public understanding but also I'm hoping it will actually open up the variety um, if we see mummers in what they what they've actually come from 
and understand that uh, we've got ways to move forward for 21st century mumming and perhaps a better acceptance of it. So my brother Damon and I started mumming um, all that time ago. <laughs> um, my brother there joined in and uh, we've had such a good time and it's been a really interesting experience for me to sort of work through all of this with the uh, Mama Symposium and, and try and understand, um, make sense of what it's all about. So at that point, I'm going to stop sharing. Jolly good. And um, open it up. I wonder if there's, um, oh, we've got a lot of, uh, <laughs> um, we've got a lot of participants. <laughs> And um, Pauline, are you going to help um, oh, work out? Like, yeah, I haven't got anything in the chat. Have you got anything in the chat, Stephen? No, I can't see anything. No, no. no. Okay, so they're all fell asleep. Up, they all fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> oh, it's first off the hot off the block. So that's Sue Allen. Hi, Steve. That was brilliant. Thank you very. Oh, much. Thank you. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. Um, a quick question. I will have a couple of questions, but I'll just do one for now because let other people in. Uh, you mentioned the origins of some of the characters, and that was really um, instructive. You know, the Doctor, Father Christmas. Um, where does the character of Hector come? Who comes in a number of plays? He comes in a number of plays, and um, well, it's he's clearly he's clearly a hero, isn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so um, perhaps the person to who could tell us that would be um, Peter, if he's still here, because um, I've. I, I remember there are one or two epic poems about Hector the hero and tunes and songs. So I'm presuming that's where, where, that's where he comes in. Like Alexander, Alexander the Great. St. George never fought Alexander the Great. They're 600 years apart, but, you know, it's part of the myths and, and bringing those in to make really good, uh, entertaining, heroic drama. Yeah, that's the stuff. That's the stuff. But I'd be interested to follow that up. Yeah, write that one down. <laughs> I wondered if it came from a uh, settled Siege of Troy um, play at Bartholomew Fair and whether yeah, that. Yeah, it, it may, it, that may well have been, or that may, have, that may have been influenced by it. Yeah. Um, a very interesting. Heck to the hero. Um, that's, that's one for us to look up, that one is. <laughs> okay, I've got a question in the chat from Dave M. I don't know if that's Dave Milner. Who said, how did the chapbooks transform into villagers performing the plays? So chapbooks were really useful to have a script that people could work from and learn. But what then happens is that once they've learned it, the chapbook probably disappears. They're flimsy little publications and the, the scripts then get passed on by word and mouth. And you can see how they evolve, you know, um, I think we've got over 60 um, scripts collected in Gloucestershire. And when you look at those scripts, um, you can see how some speeches got transferred from one village to another village uh, and how they got altered along the way and how some speeches got transferred from character to character. So perhaps, you know, somebody moved to a different village and took the, their bit of script with them, <laughs> but then ended up doing a different character. Um, in our play, we were rehearsing yesterday, which is based on two Gloucestershire plays. Beelzebub's speech was originally a doctor's speech somewhere else. So, you know, it's, 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 it's an interesting uh, thing. There's a whole load of work to be done on that. And, you know, you've got all that stuff about the um, uh, within the chat books themselves. You can see the, the progress of the uh, and the way they changed and and descended from each other people have done some work on that yeah uh-huh any more questions hands up oh Is owner who's there? owner <laughs> oh, it's the langport mamas hello hi there oh, yeah. <laughs> how are you doing <laughs> very good marvelous talk but we um devil deed out in the sweep must go back to the seasonal um New Year sweeping out of the house and the old pre-Christmas, a uh, pre um, way back, wasn't it? The sweet character, don't you think? Sounds very 18th century to me. 18th century with the sweeping around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, going back to the 
to the visiting of the houses i mean you know and i i wouldn't i i wouldn't think so there what you see is in the when you look at, at the spread of all these um plays so i've looked at hundreds of plays now oh. and uh, if you look at the master mama's website it's fantastic peter millington done a whole lot of work there and oh. uh, we got um duncan broomhead done loads of work collecting mama's plays well traditional drama forum you look at all these plays you can see how these little characters oh. were added in oh. to provide an extra role for an extra for another person to join the oh. play and so i don't think uh, devil doubt or 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 um the sweet you know are likely to be really old characters in this i think they're relatively uh young characters um uh, you know it'd be interesting to see other aspects of um contemporary literature at the time to see what kind of references there are to mm -hmm. Doubt. he may have been a character in a um uh a, a pantomime mm -hmm. you know so um there's lots of interesting stuff there We've got some more hands yeah, up here. We've got Judith Proctor and Jameson Wood as oh, came, I think. Came hello, in folks. There, in that order. <laughs> hello, Judith. Hello, Stephen. Um, I found it interesting about the, the slapstick routines and so forth, and the way they've survived because they didn't get written down. Nobody seems to bother recording them, and yet somehow they have survived purely for the oral tradition. Yeah, and that was the fantastic thing about finding them in Barbados. That was a, quite a clincher for me in that the, they are written down as Latsy. And so if you study Commedia dell'arte, and one of the things we've done at the Mummers Festival is we brought in Barry Grantham and other, um, uh, you know, authorities on Commedia. And we brought them in to run workshops and teach us how Commedia actually do them. And it, it is an eye opener. It really is an eye opener. And to th then for me to go to, to Barbados and find that that very same thing, which they haven't got written down anywhere. It's just what that character does in the landship dance. Mm. Uh, it's certainly, I find it fun. I mean, going to your workshop on mumming a few years back, because the, the script that we were working from is originally just literally the script and now has all sorts of comedy routines added into yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Okay, we've got uh, Jameson next and then Glyn, and then I've got something in the chat which I'll say afterwards. Hi, Jameson. Hi, Steve. Thank you very much indeed. A really good talk. Thank you much. Very interesting. I've got a couple of questions, really. Uh, when I've looked at my gentry and aristocratic household accounts, you get payments to mummers and wassailers and Morris dances and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, before we started doing the plays, when it's just a convivial mumming, what actually is the difference between mumming and wassailing in that particular case? And if it's just a vis is it just a visiting custom? And if I can tack a second yeah. question onto the end of that before you start answering the first, maybe, do you have any thoughts on why carnival didn't take off in England? Yes. Okay. So two questions, right? So wassailing, I mean that's a lot older tradition, and. Uh, and it's and we know it's a cadging tradition back in the uh, 16th century we've got really good evidence of that um and um look at the history of bombing mama uh, way sailors bombing way sailors fantastic history and they were actually going around singing their way sail song and collecting money for the poor so it's even a charity sort of thing uh, uh back then so you know definitely a house visiting song thing and also it was traditional to feed them, you know, food and food, food and wine. And they've, they've been able to do that. And I find those house visiting customs like that all over Europe, this idea of feeding the, the visitors uh, in that um, you know, 12 days of Christmas type thing. Well, also right up to Shrove, Shrove Tuesday. Uh, you go to Ponte Cafro, for instance. I know one or two people here will have been to that. And the dancers go around the village, uh, the houses, and uh, they dance outside, and they get fed, and they get paid a little. Uh, so there, that that's that's the way sailing, and the convivial mumming sort of works in the same way. But the thing, instead of doing a dance or singing a song, they're giving you a little bit of entertainment with this funny game, the mum chants. Um, and I quite like the idea that if you haven't got any dice, you can still do it by playing Guess Who the Mummer Is, 
which is the, the, the game they still play in Newfoundland. So that's that's part of how it works there. Oh, we've got Paul. Hello. Right before <laughs> before you go on, I've got a um, a question here um, um, from Ken, who is saying here in the US we tend to bring in contemporary personalities into the play. For example, Trump as the Turkish Knight. Is that a contemporary addition or a long-standing tradition? Certainly popular in the 20th century, but if you look at the idea of having Prince George uh, parodied in the first recorded text, then yeah, you're, um, uh, it, you know, it's, it's obviously a long-standing uh, way of doing things. I think Paul might be able to uh, help us with that. I see he's got his hand up. <laughs> um, we've got, um, in, in order, we've got Glyn, Glyn Jones um, and then I think Peter and Peter, Harrop, yeah, Sue Allen. Hopefully Peter and Paul are going to be able to uh, correct some of the things which I've said that I might have got slightly wrong. <laughs> so Glyn Jones is next. Hello, Glyn. You're, you're muted. muted. Glyn, you're, you're muted. I'll do my lip reading. There we you go. got me now. I'm no, no longer muted. <laughs> um, I, I've got quite a big collection of, of scripts, and I'm I'm interested in in uh, should these be venerated? Should sh should we really revere the scripts that we've got, or should we allow them to continue to develop and evolve, as I suspect they may have done in the past? And that previous question about the inclusion of Trump is really sort of quite quite closely allied. Well, th that's really interesting. Um, you know, um, one of the play one of the groups I know their play changes every year and the two protagonists are the prime minister and the leader of, of the opposition right so that's that's a really contemporary one and they do mm -hmm. have some routines they keep in there but it, it changes every year uh right through to um people who do a historic absolutely like a um a reenactment type thing and and i i think peter would probably say something about this is it's a fantastic diverse uh tradition and the the Mummers Festival is a real celebration of that. That we see just the most crazy, crazy, crazy things. And and sometimes we're looking at it and thinking, is this mumming? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> is it mumming? I'm not sure. But anyway, it's here and it and it's happening. So I like to celebrate that. Um, I like the fact that the scripts are um, are collected. And I get myself quite a lot out of doing it. Also, I learn a lot. So yesterday we were having our rehearsal and we had great fun with this rehearsal. Um, and finding the qualities within the text, the text really works really well. And it's an old play. Yeah. And, and, and actually where, like, like actors would, would do, finding the beat and being able to get a lot out of it. Um, a lot of those plays still work, but I'm, I'm looking out my window across here. There's Minchinhampton across here, and there's two plays collected in, from Minchinhampton. And one was clearly collected from a guy who had got his Victorian literary uh, side well-developed, and it's got immensely complicated flowery speeches that nobody can remember. <laughs> but the other play is really easy really easy to to use and works really well so you know I've, I've done i think i've done about 70 plays with schools taking the plays teaching the play in the school and then taking it back into the community and working taking the, the nearest play often from that village back in and so often i find oh if you stick to the script actually it works really well um uh you know a bit of cultural heritage <laughs> Okay, we've got Peter Harrop, then Sue Allen, and F.P. Smith. We've already, we've already had Sue. Okay. <laughs> Peter Harrop and F.P. Smith, then. Uh, hi, uh, thanks very much, Steve. Um, uh, fantastic talk. Um, somebody, uh, was it Jameson, had asked earlier about Carnival, and there is a... Um, a young American scholar who's living in the UK at the moment called Taylor Orkoyne. Um, Ron Hutton supervised his doctoral thesis at Bristol. Um, uh, he's now working out of Exeter. 
And if I can do a plug for another uh, book, I don't know if that's readable. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, there are several contributors here today, but Taylor Orkine has a superb essay in there um, uh, tracing Shrove Tide and Carnival in early modern England and the kinds of performances it attached. So it, it's a really fresh insight into all of that. And I just wanted to mention it. The other thing is, um, there is another, nothing to do with me, this one, a fantastic book, um, which is about uh, mumming in the, uh, in the Caribbean. And it, it is the most fantastic study of, of interculturality and diversity uh, and, the, and these wonderful traditions of mumming that Steve alluded to that are a mix of um, European and African a new world uh, performance, which is great. And I guess I like them because what I love about mumming is it's such a glorious mess for the last 300 years and longer um, that I really in, in, enjoy that. So I would say um, uh, revere and develop. There are hundreds of texts from hundreds of places that have been performed by thousands of people They've never stood still for a moment. So revere and develop. That's what people have always done, I think. Thanks. Lovely talk, Steve. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Peter. And a plug for your um, uh, Mama's Plays Revisited, which is, it came out, when it came out, it was um, horrifyingly expensive. But uh, how much is the, uh, the, the paperback now? Uh, Oh, still horribly expensive, but I, but I think I think it's twenty something pounds, which yes. is, you know, you can, as I say, you can you can sell the car to get it now rather than the house, but it's still despicable. But it was one hundred and twenty before, um, and I was quite relieved to have got a, a review copy. But um, anyway, can I jump? Um, sorry, the next, yeah, yeah, we've got F. P. Smith and then uh, Chris and then Tim Motkin in that order. Hi, folks. Hello. Good to see you. The FP is a piece of crap, by the way. It's just Paul Smith. But when I signed on to this thing, there were so many Paul Smiths, they gave us all a prefix. So there you go. Um, uh, that I'm really fabulous. pleased to be part of this session. I have to be briefish because I've got a house full of people downstairs. And if I don't get downstairs and start cooking, they're all going to be pissed as newts. So there we go. <laughs> Um, I've got some observations. Uh, there's lots of other things I could talk about. Um, some are more important than others, I think. Um, first of all, just as a slight thing, phrases in 12 volumes, not two. Um, chat books, uh, the Alexander and the King of Egypt was published around 1746. We know that because of the watermark in the paper. But the issue with... Um, that particular item was that outside of London, uh, printers had to be licensed. And there was a battle going on because uh, Parliament, the, you know, those in charge wanted to suppress, suppress the spread of information. That's one side of this licensing battle. The other side was that the London printers wanted to suppress printers outside of London because there were no copyright laws. But if they could get their control of the licenses, they could also stop that happening. One of the things I noticed as you were putting up these chat books and things was they're all from different dates. Some yeah. of them were very 19th century ones um, and you know, others were of the period and somewhere in the middle, uh, for instance, um, the seven champions of Christendom, um, you know, so. Yeah, I don't I don't have such a good collection as you. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into that. Um, so the licenses restricted the spread of chat books, which also brings up another issue. You know, you were talking about plays in your neighborhood and the relationship and the traditions being passed on. The chapbooks, not altogether, were a northern phenomena. 
um, and they had the most influence there, and they had the influence of standardizing texts. We can see that when you bring mm. and set them alongside the oral tradition. Um, what else have I got on here? One of the questions that Preston and I have always had about that particular Alexander and the King of Egypt chat book is that all the early references to it um, come from antiquarians, but antiquarians have actually had it in their hands, irrespective yeah. of the, where they were. So you find in an antiquarian in Exeter talking about it. Was it ever meant for distribution? You know, a lot of mm -hmm. White's things that he was printing at that time were actually coming out as historical texts and things for antiquarians. Was this another piece for antiquarians, uh, perhaps to be read as a closet drama? You know, mm -hmm. sit on the toilet and read it, you know, <laughs> they, enjoy, the, enjoy the peace and quiet. I don't know. I think it would uh, work, though, wouldn't it? it you, when you read it, you could you could perform it well. Oh you? yes, yeah. yes, yes. And there's quite a big gap between that and then the later ones the coming out ones, by yeah. Colander and Dixon yeah. and things. Yeah. But, so but they I think the interesting thing is that the language in there and a lot of the things you find you find is goes all over the place, doesn't it? The, the yeah. Lines from that one are are, are, are extraordinary, and uh, yeah, I, I just wish I had a big big resource of uh, chapbooks to look at. <laughs> Well, if anybody wants to come round and look at the ones that are sitting here, they're welcome. Um, I've got some more questions coming through on chat. If, um, if I've I just can... got a couple more quick observations. Um, I've forgotten what they were now. Uh, all right, John, John White, we've dealt with him. Um, the situation in Newfoundland, there are two traditions. There isn't just mm. a single house visit mm. tradition. Um, Widdison and I are just finishing... <laughs> He'll kill me by saying this. Uh, just finishing, that is. Um, the manuscript currently is 800 pages of playtexts from the province. Oh, there are playtexts, are there? Oh, yeah. yeah. And reminiscences and things that he recorded with Widdison from past performers. He was recording them back in the 1960s. Right. Um, so we've uh, got to so get along got with that. You've got playtexts from Newfoundland. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is good. Um, and oh, yes, going back to the chat books. Uh, Practically everything that uh, Preston and I have written about chat books and mama's plays, you can find looking up under my name on Academia EDU and ignore any requests for money. They'll eventually put you through. <laughs> um, Philadelphia, it's a combination of they have had play texts in the past. So there's that element. It's carnival and it's competitive. That's the main thing yeah, about Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. And something I'd just like to throw in for people to think about when you're talking about Fraser and all these other things, there is actually what I would consider to be a folk history of the Mummers play. And I don't think it's a single folk history, no, no. but I think there's lots of things going on. So great talk, brought up lots of good stuff. I'm glad that you played Fraser and all that <laughs> crap down. And uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, Steve's got my email address and things, and it is FP Smith on that. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to go cook. Nice to see everybody. Thank you, Paul. Great to see you. Cheers. See you. I wish I could stay on, but we've got to leave. Bye. So we've got some questions here. Um, some of the traditional rapper dances had mama's plays associated with them. Do you think this was a parody of the recruiting sergeant trying to enlist men into the army? I'm thinking about the Tommy and Betty yeah. figures who are still in the dance. Um, the other one is, um, you didn't mention sword plays. Did the mummers or the sword dance come first? Right. That was, that's a, quite an interesting one. And actually, that's a whole subject in itself. <laughs> and um, yeah, maybe that'll be another talk. Um, and I would recommend getting Steve Corson to do it as well. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, next one's Tim Watkin, Richard Rowley, and Jane Burton have questions. So, Tim Watkin. Hello, folks. Hello, Tim. Um, hi. Uh, I'm uh, Captain of Mummers for Shakespeare Morris, and we're doing a tour this, this Christmas, and I've just uh, only gave them the script yesterday, so uh, they're a bit annoyed because <laughs> it would write in a week, I think. Uh, but it was the... Con the construction of the plays because uh, having read Tiddy or sort of um, borrowed a copy should I say because uh, 
they are difficult to get hold of. It's amazing how many scrappy versions of the same play exist. It's like a big jigsaw. Only one village got the, the bits around the outside, another village got the bit in the middle, and you know, they're a bit of a patchwork quilt. So the plays, when you try to decide which one you're going to do for the season, I, I, having been in some of the scrappy ones and thought as a player, what the hell am I talking about here? Half the dialogue is missing. It doesn't make any sense. Why are people watching this? So when I was actually um, forced into the position of Captain of Mummers, unfortunately by the demise of the famous Alan Whitbread, yeah. um, I sort of took on the mantle of modifying the traditional plays and making it m more as a sort of a, a storyline. So um, keep, unfortunately, we can't get, we haven't got, you know, 11 men in our side. We've only got about six. We can manage six. So I keep the main protagonists and we keep the, the um, rhyming pentameter for the, for the hero and the villain, whatever. The Doctor and Jack Finney, that goes into a sort of a, a more common wise sort of thing. Um, uh, so sort of, uh, and then also the Doctor, I was very impressed to find out how old the Doctor is and that he was doing the patter, you know, and the sort of, um, uh, I the, actually- The business. Measure and, and I measure the body, you know, what can secure the itsy ditsy all that? And you bring out a tape measure and you measure the length of the, the recumbent <laughs> person first, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah. So I like that, the fact that's quite old. Uh, and um, Jack Finney, you know, he's the, 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 the idiot sort of assistant, whatever. But then again, on some of these, he's the clever guy. So that changes. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. the biggest one, which I always get questions about, why have you got Beelzebub in it? I mean, sort of last Christmas, I turned the spit, I burned my finger and felt it itch. The pot lid kicked up and, the, you know, Jack spit jumped up like a manager's man. No one knows what it means. And I'd love to know. Is, is it just like rhyming jokes? Is it jokes of the time? Oh, it's non nonsense, nonsense verse, nonsense speech, yeah. and 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 sometimes the doctor does that. Um, so yeah. there's quite yeah. interesting things. One of the things I do is when I'm working with with different with groups is I quite often take a play, the nearest play to them, and realise there's things that don't work or there's not enough parts for the number of players we've got. So I take the next nearest play. And usually by putting the two together, we have something that will work. Often I scrub a speech because it's just too long. And it was yeah. put it, it was written by some down by someone who thought too much about it, I think. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, that is brilliant, brilliant. And have yeah. good good time on your um on your yeah. on your tour. One more bit about that. Um I I run the risk of annoying the ritualistic presenters of, of certain Morris, uh, certain mummers plays here, because um, I'm, I'm glad you also mentioned that the, the, the hero and the villain of the time was put in. So like the first one is Prince George. It's a satire on how mm. Namby Pambia she is, whatever. So I've actually, um, over the last few years, I've put in like last year was Bold Boris and Corbin exactly. Red. <laughs> Can we, um, right, we've got three Don't other people. Um, could we uh, could we make sure that there are questions, if that's okay? If you want to get in touch um, and um, pass on your observations, that would be great. But at the moment, if you could yeah, make some questions, to, we need to fabulous. move on Thank quickly. You. Yeah. So we've got Richard Rowley, Jane Burton, and Ron Shuttleworth. Hello, Hello. brother. Richard. <laughs> You're muted. Yeah, hello there. Hello there, Steve. Nice to speak to you again. Um, very, interesting, very interesting talk. Uh, I, I suppose mine was more of an observation, not an observation, but uh, um, uh, as Steve know, a few years ago, I sailed around the Atlantic, uh, the North Atlantic, and uh, I was very struck by how, um, as we know at home, how Morris dancing has spread around from village to village and altered slightly. Um, Travelling down the coast of Portugal, I was very struck by how how it was very much connected with um, uh, Cornwall and Brittany, and on there from the um, from the trading routes, uh, and then going down to Cape Verde Islands and seeing uh, not quite a mama's play, but um, a ritualistic uh, dance of which reminded me very much of mama's plays. Uh, and then getting across to the Caribbean 
and uh, as always been mentioned about the connection with the Caribbean. Um, a dancing there, which I buy um, local groups, which I very much recognize as European dancing. Uh, and, then, and then also seeing on several islands, uh, mainly put on for the tourists getting off cruise ships, but the, um, the, the dancing uh, and the music um, performed with men in tatters and, um, uh, and men and boys and, and the music, the drumming and stuff. And I could see very much the connections with the mummers, which I've done over, over the years yeah. over here. And again, in Bermuda uh, with the Gombies on there and then their histories is where very much it's it's come to them from Europe from the um, um, from the slave trade I suppose yeah. and mixed with the African um, traditions of the dancing and the music and how it's molded together and I just thought that was a, a very interesting uh, thing and I could see very much these links and how important that trade was. Yeah. The slave trade. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, <laughs> the next question um, is from Jane Burton and then Ron Shuttleworth. So Jane, what's your question? Hi Steve, uh, thanks Hi, so Jane. much for the talk. Um, I've done mumming for quite some time but I've never really got much into the history of it so that was really good. But I, I do actually have a question for you and, and the question is, is um, kind of more moving forward than the history is, especially as you clearly go out and teach children mumming traditions and mumming plays. So how do you see going forward, I hate using that, that, say, that phrase, but I, I guess it works, with um, how watered down do you think we're going to get um, because of uh, having to be obviously more sensitive to different cultures and well, I guess you know what I mean. But yeah, how, how yeah, you... sort of the political yeah. correctness and the, and the like, in the, being sensitive yeah. to things like that. And it's quite interesting because um, yeah, the, the, the usual narrative that people have is, oh, it's Moors and Christians and, and the fight between those. And um, in the, everybody assumes that the, 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 um, it's the Turkish knight that gets killed. <laughs> and when you look at most of the plays that, that, that I've got around here, it's St. George that gets killed. <laughs> or they, yeah, they both lay each other out. But a lot of them, they got lines like, um, uh, I, you know, we'll go off together to the bar or something like that. So um, it's quite interesting to have that um, side of it. But understanding that where these things come from now is, is quite interesting. Um, I mean, before I used to have a look at saying, you know, you've got the 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 Turkish knight, uh, king of Egypt, and that kind of thing, and um, and and this Richard the Lionheart type knight character, and we talk about the Crusades, and that is an opening, uh, uh, eye opener. I've even had um, secondary school history teachers say I didn't know anything about the Crusades. Mm. and and the shocking the shocking history of the crusades so mm. actually it's a, it's a, it's a chance to open something up there but um uh but really you know uh finding the uh finding the the um uh, the route through i do sometimes change a play um you know you, you just take something out of it and i did a work with barbados and um doing Anglo Barbados project, and there was a song that we collected in Barbados called Three White Horses, and it's got a line in it that says, "What um, uh, shallow plate is a white mulatto." Now, it was about horses, <laughs> and a mulatto is a kind of horse, and it's a cross between a a, a mule and a, and, and a horse or something like that, and it was about that, but. And I, I heard that and I collected that in Barbados being sung. I went back sometime later and they sang Shallow Plates of White Banana. I said, oh, that's interesting. That's changed. They said, yeah, mulatto um, can mean a, uh, a certain kind of mixed race person. And, uh, and it's a derogatory term for that. So they've, they've changed it themselves. 
in the in the playgrounds in we feel we have to um to some degree and and maybe quite rightly i know we have in the morris but we will potentially have to continue to adapt and to be sensitive yeah Yeah, absolutely absolutely (laughs) that slightly anarchic thing which everybody loves as well but i think sometimes it can be we have got into rows in pubs um and it can be a bit of a um yeah a difficult route through it, I think. And there are so many plays and there's so much to choose from. You can choose mm. something that works as an entertaining mama's play and, mm. and can be completely traditional and and not offend anybody. You yeah. know, so it's quite easy to do that. Yeah. I can see Fee getting worried there because more people are queuing up. <laughs> that was a good question, Jane. OK, uh, Ron, uh, Ron Shuttleworth. I think Ron Ron needs to be the last one, actually, because um, he um, wanted to... Um, sort of finish off with something uh just before you say start then ron um sue do you want to type your question in and i'll see if there's time to insert it at the end um it was a question um uh, just just type it in and i'll ask it or uh, no well, well i'm quite happy to do it but i know ron wanted to go at oh, the go end on then sue go ahead right it was just Um, Until recently, I lived in a very small village in Oxfordshire, and in 2018, we were contacted by someone who was going through family papers and came across a notebook from a curate who had been curate in our village, who'd recorded the text of the mummer's play and drew a picture of them. Uh, This was 1860, and I think that's, is that quite early to have the actual text recorded and and picture? Um, it's unusual to have text and picture. It's a sketch, you know. He does yeah, sketch it. and yeah. picture. Um, I, I think, um, I think uh, there's various uh, uh, um, collectors here who would be really interested to see that <laughs> document. Right. There. It's um, yeah. the village is called Charney Bassett. Ah, yes. Oxfordshire. Yeah. It's on the history website. Oh, lovely. Right. We shall go and look for that. Thank you. That's brilliant. <laughs> right, Ron. Where's Ron? He's disappeared. Yeah, if you want to unmute, Ron. I'll just quickly interject, Stephen, that the Charney Bassett play has been dealt with uh, very succinctly by Peter Millington and uh, details of it are available on his website as well. Yeah, yeah I guessed he would be, uh, be in, into that one. <laughs> Hello? Hello, Hello, Ron. Am I there? Yeah. Yes, you are. Good. Um, just I, I could have asked umpteen bloody questions about this. I would love to discuss it with you, but just two important things. Several people have mentioned things, uh, articles, books, which they can't find difficult to get. I've got them all, uh, all um, as PDFs, and I will be happy to share it with anyone who asks. And if you look on my website, which is Folk Play Archive. If you, will, if you gurgle on that, you will get me. And there's a lot of material there. The other, if, if I can ask just one question, and is, I, I, I can contend that mumming is not acting. And I would ask your opinion on that. Yeah, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Um, I, and I find that... Um, you know, they call it a mock play. And in some ways, when you look at the history of mock plays, um, uh, it's an almost kind of an anti-acting activity. Perhaps Peter might have a, a, a comment on that, that a mock play actually mocks the, the form of a play as well. It's intended to be um, uh, uh, possibly amateur. What do you say, Peter? Um, a, a mock play can require very sophisticated acting um, uh, mumming, Ron and I uh, could probably argue about this till the cows come home. Uh, I, I, um, I know what he means. He means that there are many instances of mumming having what we might in shorthand call an intoned, declamatory, ritualistic style. But in the 250, 300 years since the first mummers players, acting even, you know, even in this country has gone through so many changes in its nature. I would simply say that mumming can be, uh, it, oh, um, it, 
mumming lends itself to a multiplicity of acting styles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. am I back? Yes, you're back there, Ron. Uh, no, my contention is that when you go out in public mumming, you get far more interest than you actually deserve. And my contention is that actors are distrusted as people who don't uh, are, are, are true. Whereas if the re if the public recognise that you are not acting, you're not trying to uh, say tell them something that they that is unbelievable or different. Uh, they give you more more attention and more interest. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it, you what what there is is that you're um that there's um there are different ways of delivering it and in a way they're all different kinds of acting <laughs> and i i was looking at um, um, um I, I think it was um paul was saying earlier it, there's sometimes you get the um you get a script and uh you you can find the beat in it you can find the things which actors use to be able to make it work really well and you can use all of those tricks um but um some of these are professionally learned and some of them are developed on the job as a mama <laughs> and a particular style as you as you like and i i, I think that's the great um uh, uh, yeah the di great diversity of it all and um and in particular um uh, uh, people might might never have seen this but uh, ron uh, uh founder of the um coventry mummers um he and one of his uh for fellow mummers does the most fantastic uh mummers the opera uh which <laughs> which is one of the highlights of my mummers mumming career was to was to see that performance <laughs> anyway thank um you've got um i presume we can give the contact through pauline yeah, um, any, yes. any, anything you want to send out, I will send out a post-event email. So yeah. I'll send out the links to Ron Shuttleworth's collection. And if there's anything else, if you send stuff that you know Stephen, if you, Stephen sends it to me, I'll put it in that email. Then you've got a link to loads of resources. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I just, well, we'll wrap up as we're half an hour over. And, Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, you're all, you're all very talkative, aren't you? And <laughs> it's been fantastic. So it's been a fantastic. Can you just unmute yourselves? so that we can all give Stephen and anybody who asks a question a round of applause, please. Brilliant. Thank you, Stephen. Well, and, thank you. It's been great fun. It's been, it's been a lot of fun and uh, I should have to watch the recording as well. So um, thank you everyone for coming and uh, we'll see you at another another talk sometime. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. 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 Thank